I'd like to recommend a book to you, and that is the book Made to Stick by Chip and Dan Heath, two brothers. If you care about having sticky lessons, having teaching lessons that stick, I think you would greatly enjoy this uh, book as I have uh, read it or listened to it, listened to it uh, more than read it, but uh, listened to it many times. And they outline six qualities of sticky lessons. The first one is simple, and that's a topic we're going to talk about today, that a good lesson has one and only one big idea. I remember in uh, in preaching class, uh, one of the, my fellow students raised his hand and said, how many points should a sermon have? And the professor wisely said, at least one. And the truth is, the answer is at least one, and usually the answer is only one. And a simple idea tends to stick to the brain. I love that idea that goes, uh, we teach so little because we teach so much. And that's going to be the big idea we're going to talk about today. But let's mention briefly a little little detour on a few other smaller ideas that we'll add and we'll get back to our big idea. Uh, the next one is unexpected, then concrete, credible, emotional, and stories. And uh, there's another S there, spells out the word success. And we're actually going to add another S. But let's t- talk about some of these smaller ideas and then we'll get to our big idea of the day. First, uh, uh, first of all, the first little idea is that good teaching is unexpected. Matthew 15, 23, and 24 is a good illustration of this. Jesus did not answer a word. A woman came to him asking for help, and he did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. She's bugging us. And he answered, I was only sent to the lost people of Israel. I'm not going to help her. Really? You didn't expect Jesus to say that, did you? And the truth is, Jesus does that all the time. And if you would teach well, you would teach in a way that is shocking, that is unexpected. One of the ways we do this in Christian teaching is based on the idea that truth is often a midpoint between two extremes. In other words, I taught for a few weeks ago on what does the Bible say about the poor? And the Bible says a lot about helping the poor and so on. But it also says, if a man will not eat, don't feed him. And I said, it is a sin to feed someone who could work and chooses not to. Because the Bible says that a man's hunger ought to drive them to work. And you wrong a man when you feed him uh, when he could work and he chooses not to. Well, I think that was a little bit unexpected. Not exactly what they ex- uh, expecting what, what the, the Bible said. Uh, sticky te- teaching is not only unexpected, it is also concrete. Uh, Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? He could have just said, God is loving, God is kind, God loves you, you're going to be good. But he said, look at the birds of the air. Look at something very concrete. Because something very concrete tends to stick to the brain. Now here is one area where Jesus is the opposite of what we want to do in that sense that he taught as one with authority and not as the teachers of the law. He was not quoting other people because he was the ultimate authority. It's the one place where I think you ought to not teach like Jesus. That is, I think you ought to quote authorities because you're not the authority that Jesus was. I taught recently on the idea that the joy of the Lord is our strength and that we ought to rejoice in the Lord always and that you ought to be as happy as you can be. And uh, to bolster my point, I quoted A.W. Tozer who said, and Christians have the right to be the happiest people on the world. I quoted Adrian Rogers who said, a joyless Christian is a contradiction in terms. I quoted Charles Spurgeon who said, my dear brothers and sisters, if anybody in the in the world ought to be happy. We are the people. How boundless our privileges, how brilliant our hopes. And Jonathan Edwards said, the end of creation is that creation might glorify God. Now we're accustomed to hearing that. We're accustomed to hearing that you ought to glorify God. But notice what else he says. Notice how, what he says, how we would glorify God. Now what is glorifying God but rejoicing at the glory he has displayed? Reminds me of the words of John, uh, uh, John Piper, who says he is most glorified glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. In the classic line by C.S. Lewis who said, it is your Christian duty, as you know, for everyone to be as happy as you can be. And it is your moral obligation to be as happy as you can be. And I bolstered my point by reading from these 
credible sources. And you would do well as you uh, uh, teach to uh, look up what other people have said. Google is our great friend on that. Find some good quotes on this and read those quotes and react and discuss those quotes. Then we want to uh, speak in a way, if we want our messages to stick, we want to, to uh, speak in a way that is emotional. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other uh, uh, apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And they said, brothers, what shall we do? Because their heart was moved. Once again, my uh, preaching professor said, it is a rare case when someone is changed except that we move them emotionally. And sticky teachers, if you want to move people, we want to move them emotionally. And find a great way to do that is the last point, and that is we'd find some stories. Jesus used illustrations to tell the crowd all these things. He did not tell them anything without illustrating it with a story. And the last of my S's, I'm going to add one more S, spell out the word success, S-U-C-C-E-S, I'm going to add an S, and that is spirit. Field. And here is our, our verse. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but with power. Our gospel came to you with power and with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. There's that uh, old line that goes, a teacher wrote in the margin of his notes, weak point, scream like crazy. And we want to scream like crazy and we want to have some enthusiasm and we want to be filled with the Spirit. We want to have that, that sense about us that the old preachers used to say that we would have something of the unction of the Holy Spirit. But I draw your attention to this word simple. This word simple. And the big idea is that every teaching ought to have a big idea. I ought to be able to stop you before you walk into your class or walk into your uh, that, that living room where you're, you're going to teach somewhere and ask you, what do you want to communicate to your people? Uh, Charles Stanley called it the burden. What is the burden? What, what is it that you've just got to get off your chest? And you might chase the rabbit and you might deal with these little ideas and these little points, but there's one big idea you've got to get your people to, to, uh, to, to, to hear. Last week, I wanted my people to hear the joy of the Lord is your strength. You need to pursue joy. You need to seek joy. You're going to try to help other people in their lives be joyful, but first, you must seek to be joyful yourself. And what is the simple uh, big idea that you want to communicate? And let me bolster this. Uh, uh, by uh, giving an example from the life of Jesus and then a few other, other people. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he took all of the commands of scripture and he made it simple and boiled it down to two commands. And that is, if you just love God and love others, life will go well for you. And good teaching is that way. It has a certain simplicity about it. Hayden Robinson said, a sermon should be like a bullet. It should be like a bullet that pierces, not like a buckshot, not like a shotgun that spreads out all over the place. Uh, Howard Hendricks said, if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. If you are a least bit unclear about what you have in mind when you are going to teach, uh, the people will be completely unclear. Truth is, if you are completely clear, sometimes they still won't get it. Uh, but we want to start by being real clear about what is the single best single big idea you want to communicate. He went on to say, Hayden Robinson went on to say, ideally each sermon, and I want to say each Bible teaching, each small group is the explanation, interpretation, or application of a single dominant idea supported by other ideas I gave you some other ideas. I gave you all six points, but I said we're trying to get to one point, I'm trying to nail home one point, and that is that one point that our sermons, our our lessons, our Bible teaching ought to have one point, supported by other ideas, all drawn from one passage or several passages of Scripture. Andy Stanley says, with this approach, every message, every teaching, every Bible study lesson should have one central idea, application, insight, or principle that serves as a glue to hold the other parts together. And I think I told you we. Or two ago. This is one of the weaknesses of my lessons. I write Bible study lessons for, for a living. And sometimes they'll include more than one idea. And the reason I do that is because I'm trying to serve you. And I, my, my theory is one, one of those ideas may not work for you. So I give you more than one. But uh, you ought to pick one. And occasionally it happened to me. I was teaching a few weeks ago in a, in a, in a small group. And uh, we were dealing with one idea and dealt with it. But I, I felt like after a while, you know what? We're kind of beating the dead horse here. And we got that idea down, and let's move on to something else. And occasionally you, you would do that, and then you might have a, introduce a second idea. Maybe there's enough time you could co co cover two ideas. But we're not going to cover 10 ideas. We're not going to read verse 1 and talk about it, read verse 2 and talk about it, read verse 3 and talk about it, and say, may God bless the reading of God's Word. We're going to say, this is the burden that I want to communicate to my, my, my people. I want you to have the joy of the Lord. I want you to know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want you to know that people who have 
have great joy in God, have great energy for God. I want you to know this is how you can have the joy of the Lord. And that is you do what joyous people do and you will come to live as joyous people live. But the big idea is I want you to have the joy of the Lord. Andy Stanley goes on to say the key to this approach is refusing to stand. And I want to say refusing to sit and deliver your, your, uh, your, your, your talk and uh, teach that lesson until you know the answer to two questions. First question is, what is the one thing, the one single thing I want my people to know? And secondly, what do I want them to do about it? What do I want them to know and what do I want them to do? And until you know the answer to those questions, you are not yet prepared to teach. Uh, two other brothers, uh, the Ferguson brothers wrote this book, The Big Idea. And he says, we have bombarded our people with too many competing little ideas. And the result is our church as with more information and less clarity than perhaps ever before. This quote reminded me of a, 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 a quote from a Juan Carlos Ortiz, a book I read when I was in uh, high school or college, I guess, guess it was. And he talked about how we go to Sunday school and, and we talk to one, about, about one idea, and sometimes it's multiple ideas. And we go to church and we talk about another idea. And then we come back, and I remember when I was growing up, we would go to uh, a church training, we called it, discipleship training. It was an hour before the e- evening service. We'd have another, another idea there, and then in the evening work worship service would have another idea. We come back to on Wednesday night, we have another idea. And uh, the Ferguson brothers are saying there's so many ideas, we don't, we don't really remember any of them. And he's saying that we ought to focus our teaching not only around one big idea in our Bible study class, but he's advocating for sermon-based groups, that the, that big idea would be discussed by your pastor in the in the sermon and then would be discussed by your people in the small group. If you'd like help with that, I'd like to write you some sermon-based groups. There's a little, little uh, advertisement on, on the side there. But he says, we bombarded our people with too many little ideas and they don't remember anything. And we do well to focus on one idea and get that one idea until until they they, they have it down. And it is one big idea at a time that brings clarity to the confusion that comes from too many little ideas. And so, teacher, I would ask you as you teach each week to ask yourself each week, what is the big idea? What do I want my people to know? And what do I want my people to do? And may God richly bless you as you teach his word to to his people uh, each week.